Ladies and gents, welcome to the John Harris podcast, the podcast formerly known as the Beyonce Knows podcast. This conversational podcast still covers all things unimportant and now important, where dark humor is encouraged and no topic is off limits. From the sublime to the ridiculous, we've got you covered. Let us know where you're listening from using the hashtag John Harris podcast or follow me on Instagram at the original John Harris. This is the John Harris podcast. Today, I'm joined by the biggest superstar guest yet. He's got a blue tick and 212,000 followers making this very exciting and me essentially a professional podcaster. Please forgive my fanboy approach to this episode. I can't quite believe he's here. TV presenter, well child ambassador, good guy. Welcome, Mr. Ed Chamberlain. John, thank you. What an intro that was. It's an absolute honour to be on. So thank you for having me. Good. Thank you very much. Um, as we discussed very briefly before, the first feature we dive into is the quickie picky feature where I'll give you a series of nonsensical questions. Um, none of them mean very much at all, but it'll hopefully give the listeners a little bit of an idea into you, your mindset. Um, and we'll just go straight into it, if that's all right. Okay, of course. Yeah, no problem. As quick fire, as long winded as you like. Question one. <laughs> Okay. How much does it annoy people uh, annoy you when people misspell your surname? Oh, Chamberlain. Now that, that's one of the most annoying things on social media. <laughs> yes, I think it's pretty obvious that it riles me as well. You also get the odd <laughs> Chamberlain, A Y N E, and all sorts, but Chamberlain. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do laugh really, honestly. <laughs> What's your favourite colour? Red, Southampton red. Southampton red. What meal would you have in the IKEA canteen? Oh, you've got to have their meatballs, haven't you? Easy. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what would you do if you weren't a television presenter? I'd like to think I'd have played cricket or football for England, but that's highly unlikely. <laughs> so <laughs> I actually dread to think what I'm doing. I'm a failed journalist, so I think I'd probably still be in the, in the journalism trade <laughs> if I hadn't got into television. Um, leads me on nicely. What was your worst subject at school? There were plenty. I think geography, probably. I live near Andover. I remember doing my geography project on uh, shopping patterns in Andover, and it was a complete and utter dismal failure, largely because oh. I fudged it. I remember I was meant to do a survey stand out outside uh, various shops, but I think at the age of 16, I was probably in a betting shop, not a, a uh, retail yes. outlet that I should have been. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, cats or dogs? Dogs. Easy. Who is your favourite co-host on ITV Racing? <laughs> Francesca, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> largely because technically she'd be my only co-host, but uh, no, she's a joy to work with. And then the rest I classify as pundits and I love yeah. most of them. I, I had to ask uh, when I asked Mr. Hoyles on the podcast I recorded with him, I said, is Matt Hancock as vibrant off camera as he is on? And he said, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Chapman, Chapman, or the, or the health secretary, both. <laughs> yeah. Um, one word to describe Ollie Bell and Chris Hughes' bromance. Vain. <laughs> uh, what's the best Disney film? Um, good question. If you ask my kids, they'd probably get a different answer. Give me, give me an idea. Give me some adult Disney films. I can't remember any. Give me, oh, give me, me anything. I mean, Frozen. Um, they oh, they yeah. go they, in the old days. They go for Frozen. Um, I've been to Disney World as well. I can't remember any Disney films. <laughs> Let's go for Frozen. It, film, get, Frozen. it kept my daughter entertained for hours on end. Yeah, and I've met I met two of the characters at Newbury as well. Oh wow! The snowman who's the snowman who I can't remember, and the lady with blonde hair. Well, I can't remember her name either. That's how, that's how big an impression Frozen <laughs> they made They really hit home. <laughs> yeah. Um, and final question, football or horse racing? That's a horrible, that's a horrible question. It's a great question. Uh, used to be football, now horse racing. Does yeah, that answer fair. that question? <laughs> yeah, exactly the answer. I was and before, before football, it was horse racing. So it's gone horse racing, football, horse racing. <laughs> um, that's the end of the quickie picky feature. You'll be probably glad to know. Oh, that, um, that last question is brutal. Well, you know, I, I've, I've been told by some of my friends giving feedback that I was, I've been a bit vanilla on some of the uh, <laughs> podcasts and, and I agree with everything everybody says, so I need to be a bit more opinionated, apparently. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Um, so, yeah, thank you for joining. This is a real honour for me, um, not just as a uh, 
a horse racing enthusiast, uh, but just in general, because um, you seem a great guy on the telly. You actually sent me a video via one of my friends tipping um, Rath Vinden in the National a few years ago. One of my friends works for the Jockey Club. Okay. Um, and I think Rathen came second or third that year. And I got, got third, it at a big yeah. price each way. So I was, um, I'm, I'm forever indebted oh, yeah, that, to you anyway. Yeah, that, that, that was one, because I write a column in the Daily Telegraph. And I, I got a bit lucky in my first two years on ITV. Because my first one, I tipped one for Arthur. My hopeless right. tipster, as every, everyone knows. Year two, obviously, I, I was having my bromance. If it's Ollie and Chris, it was me and Tiger Roll. And then year <laughs> three. Year three, obviously, I wanted to tip Tiger again, but I thought at the price, I just couldn't. Yeah. So I, I think the headline was, my heart says Tiger, my head says Rathbinden. But I should have been delighted for him coming third. But that's sort of the one in that column, the one that got away. Um, yeah. I should have stuck with the Tiger even at that price because he obviously bolted up. But yeah, you know, Rath, Rath, Rathbinden gave you a good run for your money. And that, that was the day, actually, if Ruby had won on Rathbinden, he'd have definitely retired. I remember standing in my presentation position and just seeing ruby walking around the course with his kids and his wife jillian and i thought yeah this could be it you know this this looks like it's his last appearance at aintree so we had everything geared up for ruby retiring particularly if if rath binden had won and he, he's hard to gauge ruby but i think he'd have definitely yeah retired that day hath rath binden won the national yeah and he looked good two three out as well um and then tiger all obviously said you know put the afterburners on and said <laughs> yeah absolutely i'm That's gonna write some history bol- here yeah he bolted yeah. up that day it was a brilliant performance yeah. Um, so you, you, you've had a fairly colourful career. Um, I mean, obviously, we'll go into ITV racing first. Um, I am in my probably fifth year of being really keen as a punter for horse racing. And obviously, we get ITV, ITV racing on a Saturday, sometimes a Sunday, which is fantastic. Um, but the last year, you've obviously had to handle ITV racing because I was at Cheltenham as, um, as COVID hit or was hitting here and you've had to handle it through the pandemic and i think the response has been fairly overwhelmingly positive about how like the return to sport it was one of the first first sports back as well how was that your side of the camera knowing that you're going out to a massive audience possibly bigger than ever because it was one of the first sports back how, how was that and how did how did it feel your side a real challenge if i'm honest john it was a it was a really difficult time for the country and everybody. And we came Mm. back at the beginning of June last year. And it was a challenge really for for two reasons primarily. One, the broadcasting challenge, because I presented the guineas in this room I'm talking to you in now, which is a very small spare room. And the technology they had to use to get us all in our houses, broadcasting remotely, I still a year later do not know how they did it. And yes, we've been had some lovely... um, assessments of what we'd done but it's really the guys behind the camera who deserve the credit i've no idea how they did it mm. but they did the challenge for for the being the presenter was being you know so so far from the action and also yeah. dealing with big delays it'd be like you hosting this podcast now with a four or five sometimes even seven second delay to me right. and there were different delays to different people so francesca was in newmarket with a seven second delay ollie bell was in london with a four second delay Jason Weaver, who was just down the, fran- the road from Francesca with a different delay to those two. And, and you had to sync them all together. And oh, I don't know how they did it, but we did do it. And it was very Im- important that we got on air, yeah. and gave people some kind of escape. And that was the second challenge, really, getting that tone right. The tone where, yes, it's great. The racing's back and we've got sport back. But at the same time, knowing that so many people were suffering so much. Yeah. Losing family members, losing jobs suffering with their mental well-being there was, there was so much to it so you had to get as the presenter you're always focusing on getting the tone right and the tone you had to get right in those initial broadcasts but also then you go to royal ascot which is normally such a brilliant celebration of everything british and again get the tone right because the world and the country were really suffering yeah and at the, at the time sport was an escape it was no more than that you know sport there's Hugh McIlvenny, who's one of my favourite journalists and broadcasters of all time. Sport is trivial, but at the same time, it can be very important as well. And it mm. felt important at that point, just for people's mental well-being, to give them something to look forward to. And there was sometimes, yeah. John, during the, the pandemic, if I'm honest, where the last thing on earth I felt like doing is presenting sport. But you read your messages 
on social media and the letters I've had and the emails that are sent into Reliance on Racing at ITV and just some people explaining what racing has meant to them in such a difficult time. And that gets you, that gets you out of bed and in the car and, and, and ready pre- to present yeah. because you realize just how important racing is to so many people. Yeah. I'd, I'd imagine you were delighted when it, when you went back to be able to present on track, because I remember at the start seeing the photos that yourself and your colleagues shared on social media of just wires and extension leads, <laughs> a plethora of things yeah. that you set up. Um, what a logistical nightmare, but like you said, whatever it takes, get, get it back on TV, give people an escape, give people a release. Um, I mean, I, yeah. I was very, very yeah. grateful for it coming back, certainly. Yeah, I think people, you know, you don't really want them to understand because you want it to look as normal as possible. But mm. it was such a logistical headache. And then we went back to broadcasting remotely, of course, when the second wave hit. Yeah. But thankfully, well done to the BHA and everybody for keeping the sport going. But we were every week at Kempton and Ascot broadcasting yeah. remotely, which, again, is really challenging, really difficult. And I'm on it. If I'm honest, it's sometimes difficult to listen and read things people say criticizing various elements of the of the coverage or whatever it might be because yeah. the guys are behind the scenes are producing miracles just to get it to happen we 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 haven't been able and still can't do any of the things we normally do the itv headquarters in london is closed so we yeah. can't produce the features we can't go out filming we can't do all the things we'd normally do and mm. i suppose it's flattering in a way that people have treated our coverage as if it's it's normal it's it's mm. anything but normal with a skeleton team and even now you know with hopefully june the 21st looming in a good way it's still it's still yeah. a real challenge and um yeah 90 percent of the things people are very kind but in this job as you were well aware i'm sure you need thick skin at the same time sometimes yeah well this, this podcast hasn't reached the heady heights of uh having a hater yet but maybe one day <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, you just wait. You just wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I know you. Yeah, people always there's always going to be some miserable people complaining about something. But the response, in, certainly my circles of uh, horse racing WhatsApp groups and whatnot that I'm in, was overwhelmingly positive. Good. Um, that's lovely. That's lovely to hear. Richard made a point, um, say commentating commentating on the Derby, saying. We, we've got to try and create so there's no fans the, the raw often does a lot of it for you and you hear it and and yes crowd it's like crowd noise on the football and stuff you when you know it's not real even watching the fa cup final the other day it was just yeah just, even i bought eight thousand fans it was amazing just having it back i bet you're excited for uh i mean obviously fans are back now yeah, the big events yeah the derby brings back bad memories actually that's one and i beat myself up about it a bit that's one i got badly wrong actually the derby and those commentators I mean, you've got you've got to be there to experience it. Really, how how desolate a, a race course is with no one there. Mm. Marcus Tregoning actually summed it up when he won the Sussex Stakes with Mahatha. He said he didn't realise just how awful it was until he went to Goodwood and saw just how miserable an empty race course is, and Mahatha coming into absolute stone silence. And as he said, yeah. you know, it is be- it's been better on the telly. And and the commentators, Richard Simon Holt, John Hunt, all these guys who've commentated in empty race courses deserve so much credit. For giving it so much energy. Cheltenham was the worst, that big concrete empty stand. And, you know, you just heard the wind yeah. whistling through it. Oh. And they, yet, yet they all on radio and TV and at the track gave the commentary so much verve and energy. They deserve so much credit. But they, yeah, the Derby, I got wrong looking back at it. It was the day where I realized there's no point telling people at home that, you know, it's, it's awful there and there's no crowd and how bad it is because they don't care. On, on, on the TV, the biggest difference mm. between racing and football, racing looks the same. And Serpentine to people at home looked like <laughs> some people described it as a Shergar S performance while we were there watching it. Think, what the hell is going on here? You had <laughs> this extraordinary performance in total silence with barriers around the race course because it's public land and yeah. marshals everywhere with their back to the, to the action. It reminded me, my dad was an army officer and, and we used to go to Hong Kong and one of his jobs was marshalling the border. And it reminded me of that. It was just miserable. Wow. And yeah. I got caught up in that. I got caught up in that and downplayed the derby and, and felt a bit sorry for myself. I learned a lesson that day that for people at home, they see it totally differently. And I think Richard was exactly the same with his commentary. He said, and yeah, he, he said. And I, I, I look back, that's the one show I got, well, I got lots wrong, but that's the one I really <laughs> regret in the pandemic and lockdown derby day. If I could have one day back and, and had a, have another go at, I'd have been much more upbeat on derby day. And and the day was Oaks Day as well, which which is a concept I loved actually, and love was yeah. was brilliant. Um, 
but I got it wrong that day and I hold my hands up and you know the, the criticism we get I read it all and I listen to it all and I'm, I'm my own fiercest critic and I definitely got that day wrong that's really interesting actually um I mean I and, and you certainly I mean I'm a more much more of a jumps racing fan and I watched I took the week off at of Cheltenham watched it all at home and everything and and you know made a thing of it as a lot of people did and I actually thought the footage was fantastic yes you, you knew people weren't there but I mean, I, I just, I was just glad it was on. I was devastated, you know. Who'd have thought it a year ago that we wouldn't, you people wouldn't be back? But nobody knew how this was all going to unfold. Um, but the Cheltenham, the Cheltenham um, coverage, I thought was great. And it, move with the times. Hopefully next year it'll be back. It'll be the hustle and bustle. I'll be yeah. back in the Guinness Village. Um, but, absolutely, you'll, you'll appreciate it more than ever. I hope yeah, that, that Guinness will taste better than ever. And again, what people don't realise watching is the effort when, that went into that behind the scenes. All our well, not all our camera angles, but a lot of camera angles were changed. Yeah, so that you wouldn't see those vast empty stands. Cheltenham is one of my favourite places on earth, but during lockdown, it's the, it's the worst of all the race courses in terms of optics because that big old concrete stand empty is just the worst. Yeah, and you associate it with the likes of yourself and everybody packed in, having a great time, and seeing it empty was just oh. And so we tried basically to, to not show it. Yeah, and Cheltenham and the Jockey Club did an unbelievable job at Cheltenham and helping us with that, working as a team, theming each day to support local businesses, to support racing charities, obviously to support my charity. Well, Child was an inspired yeah. move. Supporting the NHS, they did a, a sensational job in very, very yeah. difficult circumstances. And the fact that you enjoyed the coverage, you know, um, is really nice to hear. Yeah. And we'll definitely come on to Well Child in a minute. I, I just want to just cover one more thing. When, when, when things are normal and you're presenting, do you get to watch? Where, where do you watch the Do you watch it on the screen from your position? I mean, how, how does that, would you, do you ever get out to the course or are you watching it on the screen and then they come into the parade ring? No, I watch it. I, I, I very rarely watch the big screen, actually. I watch our coverage. It's cool. You know, we call right. it our output. So in front of me where I'm standing, we've obviously right. got three or four of us standing facing the cameras. I'll have three cameras and the director's in charge of telling you. The director's in charge of what you see. I have three people in my ear. A director who's in charge of what you see. So right. he's the guy, he or she is the guy who says, right, Ed, next you're talking to camera one. It might be camera two or camera three. And mm. then there's a director's assistant who's in charge of all the timing. So they'll say, Ed, you've got 20 seconds to get to the advert break. After the, after the director said, right, address camera one. They'll say, you've got 20 seconds to the advert break. <laughs> oh, we've got 10, 10 seconds of pictures of, of Cleve Hill, whatever it might be. So they're in charge of the timings. And then you've got the producer in your ear as well telling you what's coming next. They're in charge of the content. So director does what you see. Director's assistant does timings obviously very important on a commercial channel yeah. and then producer or editor, as we call them at ITV is in charge of the content. So they're the people you're listening to. Then you've got the three cameras, but you've also got two monitors and right. they, they try and put it in your eye line. So when I'm looking at camera one, I can take a quick glance mm. down at the monitor to see what the output is, whether I'm in shot or, right. or what people at home are seeing, because the, the skill of a presenter is to talk over what you're seeing at home. Sometimes not talk at all. Less is more often a, a la Des yeah. Lynham. But I will watch, I will specifically watch our coverage on those two monitors, particularly of the races. I want to see what people are seeing at home. So very yeah. rarely will I look up at the big screen. I will always look at our, our two monitors. Right. And then we have a, an extra monitor, which the floor manager, getting a bit complicated here, but there's a lot of people behind the <laughs> scenes as well. Because at Lingfield the other day, all our monitors crashed. And oh. it was so windy on Lingfield Derby trial day. Uh, our monitors crashed. I was losing talk back in my ear. Um, that was a real challenge to present. But the, the skill, again, is to you watching at home, John, hopefully you don't notice because no. a lot goes wrong and my legs are going a little bit like this under the desk sometimes. But from here upwards, you try and stay yeah. as calm as you possibly can to make it look like it's everything's normal. And yeah. sometimes behind the scenes, it's absolute chaos, which I quite enjoy, actually, sometimes. It's a good challenge. Yeah. Um, Richard Hoyles, I uh, found a quote before his podcast, you saying something like, you, you, you're calm on top, floating like an iceberg, and you're running like a swan underneath. <laughs> Often, yeah. I think, yeah, for a commentator, it'll be exactly the same. You know, as the 30 runners in the Stewards Cup are all coming straight at you, you're probably panicking inside. He's got to stay calm. And likewise, you know, um, you've just got to stay calm. The other day, you know, we, I was down at Beaches Brook 
filming my opening sequence for ITV about half past 11 and we were on air or whatever time it was, half past one. And in my ear, as I say, the producer comes through and says, this has all gone out the window. Uh, Prince Philip has died. And then you think to yourself, oh my goodness me, I'm halfway yeah. across the track here. I need to get back and get set up for a completely different show. And very quickly yeah. it became apparent there would be no adverts during the show. We needed tributes and you're thinking, yeah. oh my goodness. And, and your legs are then panicking. But yeah. on the surface, hopefully as cool as you like is the is you the can also always go to sir ap for a, a, a quick joke or anything if you're ever struggling because he's he seems to be absolutely on the money he um, is yeah he's a he's a he's he's an evil so-and-so and, and listen some people say <laughs> another issue recently comparing him to ruby walsh why would you compare him to ruby walsh i don't want ap to be like ruby walsh one yeah. ruby walsh is more than enough two ruby walsh is a big exhausted Especially and with his current gives, haircut <laughs> exactly and ap gives me something completely different he's a statesman yeah. Um, a sarcastic one at times, as you say, but a funny, funny man. And I, I love showing yeah. that Sir Anthony, the hardest sportsman you'll ever wish to meet, is actually, he, he's a softie and he's a, just a lovely, lovely, generous, superb bloke, basically, yeah. which hopefully is coming across on ITV. Yeah, I, I actually find with horse racing, unlike other sports, I mean, I'm a Liverpool fan. I follow Hartlepool United, which is my my mother's team but i found horse racing is a sport i've engaged with more than any sport and I, i've spent my entire life playing hockey was my sport i'm into ultramarathon running these days but horse racing why racing I've, then what what is what is it about horse racing so a friend of mine rob took me to ascot for a flat meeting years ago now when winter in, was running yeah. and winter won a couple of races and i had a good day and it and it was it was a 50 quid day made a hundred quid, whatever, and went back and went back and found myself just thinking and trying to find weekends where I could go to meetings. Went Brilliant. to a jumped meeting and was hooked. By the next time, I'd first time to read at Cheltenham, I'd, I'd, I was spreadsheeted up, I was uh, trackers and everything, and just dived in <laughs> and, and love it. And that, that's why I like the jumps, because two, three lengths means nothing going over the last Whereas I find in the flat, if there's a furlong left, three lenses, pro- your, your winner's probably nailed on in most circumstances. Whereas I've I just gone over the, the last at Cheltenham, and I, I often go out at Cheltenham to watch um, and get right by the side, go to the Guinness Village and get over the last two fences and just listen to them. And I love, because they come thick and fast there. And I just just hooked. But I, I find, because the coverage is on, and because it's on every single day, it's racing every single day, whether it's class five, at wherever you can always be involved in it and it's a sport i, I bought my first shares in a horse last year minuscule Brilliant. stuff so, Brilliant. I'm supposed, to, supposed to go on saturday for my first ever owner's badge but then she became a non-runner which was a shame um and so i couldn't go with the rules but it it's just a sport where oh i don't know it, there's all sorts of weird and wonderful people people who you wouldn't expect to be involved in horse racing and i just love it it's so much this fun is absolute music to my ears hearing that honestly <laughs> because as you know the one thing we've tried to do with itv you know I, I see our job as trying to get people engaged with horse racing like you've done there with your mate rob well done him for mm. taking you to ask it but i like to think particularly in lockdown people have have, have given racing a try on ITV because, you know, the, the viewing numbers have obviously been enormous. Yeah. And I'd love to think in 10, 15 years' time, people will look back and think, oh, that's the first time I tried racing, gave, yeah. gave it a watch on ITV, and now I'm going racing, and now I've got a little share in a syndicate. And maybe even, you know, some people see us as a rival to racing TV. We're not a rival to racing TV. We're the opposite. We want, as Richard probably said, we want people to get a taste for it. Yeah, and then go and sub- subscribe to Racing TV. Then we've we've done our job. But our challenge is to is to keep everyone happy as best we can along yeah. that scale in racing. So we've got you who's been involved in it for five years and now love it. So we want to keep you happy. We want to keep someone who's been loving racing for fifty years happy if we can. But we also want to engage people to get people fascinated by all mm-hmm. the nuances you refer to there, the language, all the little intric- intricacies yeah. of racing, which are its strength, not its weakness. And yes, we've tried to break some of them down and explain a few things but um hopefully we've got lots of people engaged and enjoying it and yeah and and wanting to get to get a taste and and, and learn more about the sport because as you say there's nothing like it once you do get that oh, that bug it's, it's the infectious best. it's the best um 
We talked about Well Child earlier. I want to go into that before we go to any ad breaks or anything, because obviously a charity very, very close with you and then um, sponsored the Gold Cup this year, which was just absolutely fantastic. So tell us about that. Tell, tell us the story of Well Child. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I mean, it's still surreal to hear the words, the Well Child Cheltenham Gold Cup. I mean, yeah, yeah. For, for a small charity based in Cheltenham. And that was the hook, really, is that, ITV wanted to theme each day. The Jockey Club we work very closely with now as partners, effectively. Mm-hmm. And they wanted also to support local charities and business. So the fit was there. Um, I probably get more credit for it than I deserve, really, that link up. But it, it goes back, my relationship with, with Well Child, nearly 10 years now. And I was being treated. I was having chemotherapy when I was mm-hmm. ill in Southampton Hospital, who saved my life, effectively. Mm-hmm. And I spent a lot of time in there. And, and I, I remember lots of things very vividly. I remember every morning having had chemotherapy, which would last between 10 and 12 hours generally overnight. And my challenge wow. the next morning was to, to take my anti-sickness tablets and my remedies to try and make sure I could get down to the WH Smiths and the concourse. Anyone who knows Southampton Hospital will know where I mean, to get yeah. my racing post and then stagger back upwards, get into bed and I'd be happy. I'd have my racing post and I was off and running. But often as you, as you walked around, you'd, you'd bump into children, the children's cancer ward was separate, but you got a glimpse of what like life was like in there. And and I found it hard in the wards I was in. You'd make friends with somebody who wouldn't be there the next morning and things like that. It was it was mm. a real eye-opening and horrible time, but eye-opening time. But what really lived with me is what the children were going through. Um, and it, it it breaks anyone's heart to see a child in hospital, let alone in a cancer ward. And it really, really affected me. And I said to myself, if I recover, which it quickly became apparent that, you know, I was going to when mm. blood, blood, everything's judged by blood markers. And if you read Lance Armstrong's book, his, his blood markers were up in the tens of thousands, which is terrible. You want it to be low. And mine were high, were very elevated when my chemotherapy started. But uh-huh. when your blood markers start to come down, that pretty much shows you you're on the right track. Your cancer hasn't spread. So I knew I was going to be OK after a while. And I was very strong mentally. But I said to myself, when I get out of this place, out of Southampton Hospital, I want to do something that will help get kids treated at home. I, I, I just couldn't get my head around the thought of kids, you know, being in hospital for extended periods of time. Yeah. And I then found out what Well Child did and how Well Child nurses seriously ill children at home. And it, you can imagine why that resonated with me. Um, I was in touch with them and did all sorts of bits and bobs for them. And then pretty quickly actually the um the boss there colin dyer said would you like to come on board and how do you fancy having a golf day in your name and i'm i'm thinking i'm just a you know i thankfully i've got back into presenting i was um on sky sports news then and i think why on earth would uh-huh. anyone call a uh, a golf day after a pretty useless presenter like me <laughs> um but he he thought it would work so i thought okay we'll, we'll run with it It'll probably last one year and here we are, whatever it is, seven or eight years later, though we had to sadly abandon this year and we'll go again next year at the Belfry. And, it, and, it, yeah. and it's grown and grown. And it's one of the biggest satisfactions in my life, I think, John, is the fact that my golf day raises enough money to finance mm. a well-child nurse uh, to look after Amazing. a child for a year. Yeah. And that means the world to me, you know, and just motivates me to want to do more. And then, yeah, for, for the jockey club to have linked up with well-child for... Awesome. The, the gold cup and see those kids drawings on the on on the winner that day um yeah very emotional to be honest and i'm just hugely appreciative of everyone that helped and and honestly those guys at Wellchild, they're a very small team who've had a very very difficult year yeah and the the head office in cheltenham i refer to is basically a, a ppe headquarters rather than an office these days because yeah. all the nurses obviously have to wear it and so on and so forth it's become a sort of distribution area for the nurses yeah ppe rather than a an, an hq of a charity but they've, they've worked wonders i'm just so thrilled that i can play a very very small part to help it's it's awesome i i do know southampton hospital um well i know where you mean and i i, I think with a lot of stories like this there's there's very seldom a normal way that they begin there's, there's a there's a moment like like you've described there are a series of moments and those are the best stories for me where something has touched you and hit you and you thought, I need to do something about this. And yeah. most ideas like that don't happen. You know, you, you have an idea and you think, and it just never comes to, to fruition. 
And I can imagine for you that moment, because everything going on, no fans there, there's millions of people watching on TV and the well-child Cheltenham Gold Cup. Those words must have just oh, ingrained on your mind. It's just yeah, awesome. and, then you, and then you hear you hear stories like what the Irish stable staff, who'd been through so much just to be there, mm-hmm. and they were such a big part of Cheltenham, they actually gave it some atmosphere. There was only a handful of them, but they clapped and cheered everything and everyone. And then to hear yeah. that they'd all got together to raise, you know, 25 grand yeah. for Wellchild. I mean, for me to say that on national television, I had a proper lump in my throat. That just yeah, yeah. was incredible. And, any, and everyone else who supported, you know, owners and the Donnellys after they won one of yeah. the big races donated to, to Wellchild. Oh, it's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. unbelievable. Uh, most importantly, if there's ever a vacancy in the a space in the golf day, let me know. I'm more than happy to come along and support. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, May May next year at the Belfry, we'll go. Having missed out, well, we're going to crank it up and make it the biggest and best golf day we possibly can. It's it's wow. um it's really it's really grown and grown. It's a yeah, it's an amazingly well supported day, and they do a, a special edition of the Racing Post for it, and got great sponsors in Skybet, obviously, and Jay Lindeberg and um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a really cool day, and I've really missed it this year because I really enjoy, and and you know, getting people together from Jamie Carragher to Matt Letizia to Ian yeah. Wright and all these the footballers who I don't see very often these days would support the golf day, mm. and and not to be able to do it this year is a, a real sadness, particularly with yeah. the, the funds it raises for Wellchild. But yeah. we'll make amends, John, and and we'll get you involved in due course. Happy days, yeah. Maybe uh, this podcast will take off, and then I can caddy for you next year. <laughs> um, not a bother I need to get Richard Hoyles playing golf as well we need him involved yeah absolutely we can both commentate <laughs> um, I think that's a nice time to go to the ad break um, so when we come back we will have more conversation with Mr Ed Chamberlain uh, and cover some more topics the following message is a party political broadcast for the Liberal Democrat Party hello we are the Liberal Democrats the most liberal of all the Democrats. This part of political broadcast, if we're honest, is just to remind you that we do still exist. We still do have policies, or at least a policy, of being liberally democratic. And I think our logo is still a slightly off yellow. Anyway, vote Liberal Democrat. Ah yeah, my name is Dave, or as I'm known in the business world, DVD Dave, I can convert your VHS collection to brand spanking new DVDs, a digital video disc at the forefront of technology. Forget Blu-ray, he's just a rude look from down the pub. DVD Dave, for all your video based needs, you can find my details in the latest edition of the Yellow Pages. Welcome back to the John Harris Podcast. I'm joined by Mr. Ed Chamberlain. We're going to go into the legend and loser feature of the week now. Um, Something that may well be a little bit sprung upon you, so I shall tell you mine first, if you'd like. My legend of the week is Eddie Hearn, um, although I did write this a couple of days ago because he's a hilarious guy, but he finally got the AJ Fury fight booked. And as of yesterday, that's potentially up in the air. But he's still my legend of the week for doing his side. Um, My loser of the week is Gavin Williamson, the education secretary, um, bringing tuition fees down to a still abominable seven and a half grand a year, um, and possibly the disappearing of arts courses, which just seems absolutely obscene to me. So he's my loser of the week. Who are yours? Legend of the week's easy. It's Joe Mercer, who passed away at the age of 86. Yeah. A, a man who I never met, but loved a feature we did with him. And it's quite poignant that we spoke to him, really, ahead of the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of Brigadier Gerard's 2000 Guinea, mm-hmm. which was a momentous day because Brigadier Gerard is one of the great horses ever, ridden by yeah. one of the greatest riders ever. 50 years on from Bruff Scott's first broadcast ever. So really quite emotional to think that was only just the other day. And, and when mm-hmm. Bruff spoke to Joe, he was still in, in brilliant form, uh, even at that age. Um, and watching back his, his riding, mm-hmm. what a skilled jockey he was in the saddle. 
And I wish I'd got a chance to meet him and talk about yeah. Chris and Brigadier Gerard and all these great horses he rode. So Joe Merce is my legend of the week, <clears throat> my loser of the week. Um, I feel sorry for Jason Watson this week for his ban, but um, my loser of the week, I'm going to give it to Ryan Bertrand at Southampton, who's a player I absolutely love, <laughs> who's going to leave the Saints on a free transfer this summer, which I'm desperately sad about. Yeah. And... He's far from a loser, but we're very sad to lose him. And whoever gets him, he's, even at the age of 32, yeah. he'll do a great turn for them at left back. Um, you don't need a left back, but there's plenty of clubs that need a good one. And yeah. he's a player and a great character too, Ryan Bertrand. So I'm very sad. And Southampton are the losers in, in him coming to the end of his contract. Yeah, fair enough. Um, talk about football. I can see behind you uh, a montage of... Monday night football. Uh, I want to yeah, that was my you. leaving present. Actually, that was my leaving present when I left. Oh, fantastic! Left, uh, the football, yeah, from from Cara and Neville and Thierry and all those guys. Yeah, so that um, I've got on my note here. Yeah, presenting ITV football, obviously, uh, and ITV football, wasn't it? And Sky Sports. Um, am I right? Or have I written that down wrong? So my, the, the football was just at Sky. Just at Sky. Oh, embarrassing research from from me, there, isn't it? Um, That's okay. But tell me about your time on. Sky Sports Football, because that was cool. You said, obviously, you've got some of the, the footballers involved in the golf day and stuff. That must have been really cool to be involved in some big, big football matches over your time. Yeah, I was very lucky, wasn't I? I mean, I had... In television, you need luck. You need, you need luck. Anyone who's watching who wants to work in television, you've just got to get your foot in the door anywhere, and then it's up to you to take advantage and work damn hard. And I got very lucky getting into Sky in the first place. You know, I was just doing a, a mm. sports show on Bloomberg television and a Sky executive saw me. Andy Melvin was his name and got me in. I was absolutely hopeless, but he saw something. And once I got my foot in the door, I was going to make damn sure I made the most of it. Mm. And again, I got lucky. And whenever it was 2010, I'd come back from my illness and I was working again. And then the Keys and Gray situation happened where I um, yeah. ended up with Andy Gray losing his job and Richard resigning and I again I was just I was doing a 10 to midnight shift on Sky Sports News going nowhere but having a lovely time and I was put on trial for the main football job I was 14 to 1 to get it with Paddy Power I remember it well <laughs> did you and was given a sh was given no I didn't but I know a few <laughs> people who did um and I was given a, a few games and it quickly became apparent you know the first game oh dear it was an absolute day. I remember it well it still haunts me full of Newcastle but then I did the Manchester derby was my third game the Rooney overhead kick and things started yeah. to accelerate. And then at the end of that season, I was given the big job, thrown in at the deep end. And they said, we've got great news for you. You're going to be the face of Monday Night Football. And they said, there's bad news. And I said, what's that? And they said, you're going to be doing it. Gary Neville, who was <laughs> just, just about the most unfootball, unpopular footballer in the country, as you would appreciate as a Liverpool fan. Um, but what an opportunity. <laughs> what an opportunity I was given there. And I was determined to make the most of it. And... I was thrown in at the deep end. It was difficult. Nothing like as difficult as it's been um, changing from football to racing, but still a yeah. major challenge. And started off with Gary. We trended globally off that first show, Man City Swansea. I remember the Aguero hat trick. Just yeah. all negativity. <laughs> it was just, it was brutal. <laughs> at, it was brutal at the time. But we, we turned that round and yeah. um, Super Sunday went well and working with Sunes and Redknapp and all these guys and Thierry, as you can see behind me, came on yeah. board. And it was just a great time. And then we were flying high on Monday Night Football with Gary and we, we won an RTS award together. And I thought life can't get better than this because when I first started Sky, everything went wrong. I presented yeah. shows like 90 Minutes and the full SP, all of which lasted about one season and got culled. Yeah. So I was thinking, I, you know, I've loved television, but I'm not doing very well at it. And I thought my career is a bit of a disaster. But then it took off. And then I remember the fateful day when they said, we're changing things. And Gary was always like Sir Alex Ferguson, wanting to change things. When you're at the top, that's when you make changes. That's when you move on a Roy yeah. Keane or a Yapstam a la Sir Alex Ferguson. I'm thinking, we are flying here. This could not be going better. We're winning awards and acclaim and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And then Gary says, we need to change it, Ed. We need to change it. And I'm like, you are joking now. You are joking. This is brilliant. We are flying. No, no, no. We need to change it, Ed. <laughs> and then, of course, I learned that, that Jamie Carragher is joining our duet um, and I yeah. thought it was the end of the world. And you can imagine what Twitter made of that. I had death threats to my children ah. and all sorts of oh, horrors. Oh, wow. Oh, it's unbelievable. A lot of people, you'll oh. get an interpreter, won't you? And you just have to ignore it. Look at it now. I mean, um, it was just, oh. with just a magic three years with those two before Gary went uh, to Valencia, which obviously went extremely well. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it was just a magic time. I didn't need to move. I didn't 
you know, I was loving it. Um, and Dave Jones, to be fair, has done a brilliant job since I left. But mm. I was just up, up for another challenge at the time, John. And, yeah. and Gary, as I say, was with England and, and Valencia and an era had come to an end and I was ready to do something different. And in 2016, ITV came calling and um, amazing. Yeah, the rest is history. Yeah. And the amount of people who get to leave something while on top is fairly few and far between. So that's awesome. I actually think the Carragher Neville thing, I think it's brilliant. I think it's so light heart. I think they, they bounce off each other and still today they still do really well. They're dead, they, you know, and they have their photos on Twitter every time United or Liverpool lose. And, they're good. They're good. They're yeah. good guys. That, that's why my job was so easy in many ways because they were so disliked and wanted yeah. to be disliked. <laughs> That was part of the sort of Liverpool and Man United ethos. They, yeah. they were this island, if you like, and, and we were the sharks around it. And they, that's, that created that siege mentality and was a big part of their success. But I quickly realised that they were both just really good guys. Yeah. Funny, engaging, warm, both family guys. And they're still, you know, if I have a disaster, I think they're the first people I go to, believe it or not. They're just brilliant, brilliant individuals and human beings. And I was able to show that as the presenter and just lob in the odd grenade, you know, who's better, Skulls or Gerard, and just watch the carnage around me. And it was very, it was like, I often liken it with those two because they're so fast moving and, and, yeah. and Carragher's an absolute menace, always joking, always up to no good, a live yeah. wire permanently. While Nev, who gets up at sort of four in the morning, could be prime minister. He's got a view on everything. He's absolutely <laughs> exhausting. He's brilliantly exhausting. But I love them both dearly. And, and, I was able, it was like, I'd likened it to driving a Formula One car with those two. All I needed to do was just gently touch the steering wheel yeah. and just guide them in the right direction and they did the rest. So my job was actually quite straightforward. And I never wanted it to be about me. I, I, I like to be sort of referee in the background. Des Lynham's my hero in life. And I, I try and do things right. about a hundredth as well as he did. He was just the doyen of presenters. But I, I very much have his ethos. And I loved getting the best out of those two. It gave me immense satisfaction. And they are two brilliant guys who I take great satisfaction and see them doing so well on and off the pitch. They are, mm. they are just top, top guys. Uh, and who is better in your opinion, Skulls or Gerard? You can't say Ryan Bertrand Steve, for this one. <laughs> Steve Williams is the best midfielder I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> Skulls or Gerard? <laughs> the great thing was I never had to offer an opinion uh, on either. Skulls for his passing, Gerard for his goal scoring, probably. Yeah, um, fair enough. For his... Sitting on the fence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed lobbing in grenades like that. It was great. Yeah. Fun. Oh, I just watched them implode. Um, you said about, I think earlier earlier as well, about Des and I'm saying less is more. Um, it reminds me of the famous cricket commentator. I think, was it Richie Benno? Richie Benno who yeah. came in for his 20-minute stint once, once on one of the test matches at one stage, didn't actually say a single word because the cricket was so engaging and then went back out for his, for his tea break or whatever, or to go and commentate over on the radio. Didn't say a single word in, in one of his stints. And I think, I mean, he, he's widely renowned as one of the greatest cricket, cricket commentators there's ever been. And less sometimes is more, especially in sport, I think, when often things are just unfolding. And imagine that's something you'll have to you'll experience and have to learn as well, is it? Yeah, absolutely. And it comes with experience, a lot of it. I think two things for any presenter. Again, I'm sure young presenters will be listening to the John Harris podcast. And I hope so. Just the message from me is let the pitchers do the talking a lot of the time. It doesn't need words. A la Richie Benno. I mean, Des Lynham used to just open the Grand National with big day today. He, yeah. he he's the best Grand National presenter ever, yet didn't even like it. Was that if you right? Speak to him, it didn't particularly enjoy presenting the Grand National, but he's <laughs> he's the best at it and knew very little about racing. You know, you probably know more about racing than I do, John, and that's sort of on purpose because when I first got the job, I thought I needed to know everything. I don't. I, I want to be the person asking the questions for people yeah. at home to make racing accessible and understandable for people at home. As soon as I start imparting information, you know, turn out the lights. You know, that's me gone. Yeah. That's not what I'm about. Not what I want to do. And likewise with my preparation, oh. I've got Haydock in front of me for the weekend. I will have reams of notes for Haydock. I'll use probably a tenth of them, if that. Mm. And as a presenter, you've just got to learn to be selective, learn that your job is to get the best out of other people and just let the pitchers do the talking. You'll, you'll see me go to an advert break. And sometimes I remember it at York, just using the words, this place is special. And just let the pitchers, beautiful pitchers of the city yeah. of York and the Knave smile, and all, just let it breathe. Let, let it, you don't need to speak all the time like that just yeah. i just went this is a special place and just let the 
a la Des, really. He'd have said things like that and just let the pictures breathe. Yeah. Um, and that, that's very much my ethos. Some people, you know, TV is subjective. Some people hate the way I do it. Some people like it. Thankfully, the bosses like it. So, yeah, more people like it than hate it. That's all about it. <laughs> Who knows? Who, um, who knows? Who knows? You've, I mean, you've got to do it your way. You've got to be natural and, and do it your way. Yeah, I'm very much, I mean, this is only episode 12, but I'm in the infancy of doing this. But I, I've, in a similar mindset, actually, I'm speaking, this podcast is about you, it's not about me. I'm, I've probably done a bit too much talking, to be honest. But yeah, I'm just, no, I, I, I love... natural, very good, very impressed. <laughs> well, oh, I'll write that down and frame it. Um, I know uh, we haven't got too much longer, so I do want to get onto the, my, um, perhaps my most exciting feature is the refer a friend feature, of which you are a victim of <laughs> sat, sat with me now talking um richard holes referred you the idea being that if you refer a friend and they come on to the podcast i will donate money to a charity obviously in this case i will donate to well, to well child um so you've got some big names while we've been on there uh, on here so it's a very good idea a- I, I see what you've done here this is clever very clever <laughs> yeah, well yeah. done Wind it up, get all the big names, get the Thierry Henrys out, the Gary Nevilles and, and all of that. And the so, crikey, you, you call me on the hot. We could aim very low. We could aim very low here and go for an Ollie Bell or a Matt Chapman or a, a Chris Hughes. <laughs> let, 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 let's, aim, let's aim high, John. Let's aim high. Let's, let's refer the greatest jockey that ever lived and refer Sir Anthony McCoy and see if you can, or we well, can get him on the John Harris podcast. Well... What people don't understand about him, again, is he is the nicest, most generous person you'll ever meet. The work yeah. that man does behind the scenes. I'm, I'm a uh, trustee for the Injured Jockeys Fund. And if people at home knew what Sir Anthony does, people, they would just be in awe, even more yeah. than they are, because he doesn't want publicity for it. He is incredible what he does for yeah. beneficiaries, be it on the phone, on visits. And again, a bit like Carragher and Neville, I knew, I know, and, and it sums it up, when I was ill, going back to that, for a second. Mm-hmm. McCoy, when he rode his winner number 3000 at Plumpton, went on TV and said, I'm giving all the money from today to Ed Chamberlain's cancer fighting fund. And I was in hospital thinking, what the hell? He never told me that. Yeah. Um, and that's the guy he is. And it's amazing. if he knows that the well child are benefiting, he'll be on the John Harris podcast in a flash because that is the bloke Sir Anthony is. Yeah. And you'll have fun with him because he'll, he'll enjoy talking, talk more about Arsenal Football Club and Liverpool than about racing. And then he'll be in his element. Well, it's it, over to you to hopefully uh, spur him on. I'll I'll give him a tweet, but uh, if you can spur him on, that would be another another geek off for me, really, because as a horse racing enthusiast, watching and don't pander to him. him, don't pander to him, John. You've got to be <laughs> stir him up, poke 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 him like I would, like I described the way I used to poke Neville and Carragher. Just wind yeah. him up a bit, um, because the thing about Anthony is he, he as you can see, he's, he's got a great sense of humour and he's, he's he's menacing, but you can't be too yeah. nice to him if you pander to him. And tell him how great he is. He gets bored. Tell him, tell him he was useless. Uh, wind him up about how how bad his golf is and his football team is, and then you'll get the best out of McCoy. <laughs> well, the, the, if he's an Arsenal fan, the football team is going to be easy, um, low, yeah, be, low be, hanging fruit be, this year. Be brave. Be brave. Poke the bear. Great advice. Um, I guess just just before you go, then, and like on that piece of advice, have you got any words of wisdom for me um, as a an aspiring media person? Um, for want of a better phrase, any advice for me getting into this? Like I said, this episode 12, I'm new to it. How to make it work? Any golden nuggets? Well, you're doing, you're doing. So in, in lockdown, I set up my own company called um, Chamberlain Sports, which does mm-hmm. media training. And you're doing what I, I advise a lot of young people to do is, is get out there. There's no excuse for not getting mm-hmm. out there in this day and age by writing blogs, um, doing podcasts, interviews, because very rarely will I say no to an interview because I want to support young people trying to get into the industry. And it's amazing if you're brave enough and ask who you might get, let's hope you get Sir Anthony McCoy on a podcast, which he'll do it. Yeah. You've just got to get out there and be brave. And journalism is the route into, into television and, and just work on getting your foot in the door. If you can get your foot in the door and there's no excuse these days, when I started out, there was BBC ITV and that was about it. Sky yeah. then obviously came along. But now you've got BT, you've got Amazon, you've got Netflix trying to get sports content. You've got all the online engagement. You've got all sorts of subscription channels. And there's just so many outlets to get yourself out there. 
and you just need one person to like what you do. You need one person to listen into the John Harris podcast and think, oh, this guy's got something about him. Yeah. Open the door for you to come in at whatever level. But my advice is when you do get your foot in that door, that's when you have to take advantage. If, if there's yeah. one lesson to be learned from my journey, and I've had some luck getting to certain positions, it is when you do have that luck or you do get that opportunity, <clears throat> take it with both hands. Work mm -hmm. really hard, really get every last drop a little bit again the Carragher and Neville syndrome neither of them were particularly talented or good footballers when they were youngsters in fact Gary was a better cricketer than he was footballer yeah but they squeezed every last drop of ability yeah. they had through sheer hard work and determination to play football for England and now look at them on television that's they're, yeah. they're good on television John not by accident that's hard yeah. work That is hard work. Those two were relentless on WhatsApp and preparation and Monday night football. We used to go on air at seven o'clock. We'd work all week on that and we'd start yeah. rehearsing at two o'clock on a Monday afternoon and we'd rehearse and rehearse and rehearse yeah. largely until Gary was happy because <laughs> he was the sort of <laughs> director, producer, everything rolled into one. Yeah. That's hard work that makes them successful. And there's a lesson in that for all of us. Yeah. Awesome. I appreciate it. And I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. This was, uh, like I said at the pleasure. start, I was, I was worried about fanboying a little bit because I've, I've been a huge advocate of the ITV coverage, coverage <laughs> against and trying to get friends of mine into racing and everything. So thank you so much for joining. Um, it's been a real pleasure for me, really insightful, some good stories. Um, well done for Well Child. I thought awesome. Um, well done for the coverage. I, like I said, I absolutely love horse racing, so it's, it's great for me. And uh, thank you for joining the newly rebranded first episode of the John Harris Podcast. It has been a pleasure and a real honour, and I wish you the best of luck, John, for the future. Good luck. Thank you very much. <laughs>